It's me again. <laughs> um, it's really my pleasure to introduce the second final speaker, Phil Willing. Willing. Um, I saw a picture of him before I met him. I was uh, doing some research on the Italian man, and I ran across a picture this of him up to his chest. Oh, okay, you can do it. Right? You go right here. Yeah. And I thought, this looks like a really interesting guy. And I met him, and it turned out that was the case. He's a fascinating scientist, uh, academic researcher, Illinois Natural History Survey, Prairie Research Institute, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Before that, he was a senior research biologist at the Jan John G. Shedd Aquarium, uh, Daniel P. Heather Center for Conservation of Chicago, and before that, he spent years at the Field Museum. It's an extremely long record of professional service. Uh, and I'm going to mention a few examples that are apropos of what we're doing here today. Endangered Species Protection Board for the State of Illinois, he's a board member. Uh, Association for Wolf Lake Initiative, a member of the Board of Directors, um, and he was elected president in 2021. Uh, he worked with the Great Lakes Bottom Mapping Data Needs Assessment, organized by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in, in 2020. There's dozens of professional publications. I'll just mention two recent ones. Conservation Guidance for the Least Brook Lamprey and Conservation Guidance for the North Brook Lamprey. Um, the Lillard. All right, so today, this presentation sort of focuses on Wolf Lake, but you can basically interchange this with Big Marsh, Lake Calumet, Calumet region, the general story is kind of the same. You, you sort of heard a lot of this in, in Ted's particular talk right there. I'm also, there's going to be a little bit of overlap with Ted's talk, but I'm going to be a bit more aquatic focused and focused in on particular aspects of that. And one of the reasons I kind of left Wolf Lake up here is because I happen to have a lot more fish data focusing on Wolf Lake as opposed to other parts of the region. <coughs> now, to understand what's happening with the aquatic systems down here, you first have to understand what's going on with Lake Michigan and some of the processes up there. <clears throat> so here we are, here's downtown Chicago, Lake Michigan. We are right here. And so we have the state of Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin up there. And one thing that you need to know about is that the prevailing currents along Lake Michigan near the shore start in the north, run down to the south and over here. And so what this has set up over the past hundreds to thousands of years is that these currents are eroding away the shoreline in Wisconsin and Illinois, picking up that sand and silt, carries it along the shoreline and has been dumping it into the bottom of the southern end of Lake Michigan. This impact basically has been filling in the lake in this direction. And you may remember some of the pictures that Ted had of the dune and swale on all the ridge lines. That's, a, that's one of the artifacts of this filling in over there. Indiana Dunes also, once again, created by sediment from this area carried down into here. Now, here's a series of maps showing this over time. Uh, the top one, this might be a little small, but this is around 4,000 years ago. And it, it is showing that Lake Michigan extends down to this point. And then what happens is uh, every once in a while, a little embayment. Uh, sort of form, you get these bays, as the sediment comes down, it forms spits, these spits kind of close this off, and over time, um, you have what is called the early Lake Calumet right here, more sediment fills in, creates an early wolf lake. So to go back around 4,000 years, if we were to hold this talk at this site 4,000 years ago, we would be on the bottom of Lake Michigan, all right? We'd be underwater here. This was all lake right here. And it's only slowly filled in over time, creating Lake Calumet, Wolf Lake, and all the other lakes and the wetlands that you were talking about. And also to drive that home, here's sort of a current map of this. And what these lines are, this is peat that has been carbon dated to give you an idea of how old these particular lines are. And you can see from this that Big Marsh Lake Calumet is only around 2,000 years old. All right? So that's relatively young. It's about 2,000 years old. Wolf Lake over here is roughly about 1,000 years old. Once again, relatively young ecosystems. These have not been here that long. And we can go back to some more recent data right here. Here's a map of Wolf Lake from 1896. On this map, I know you can't read this, but each one of these is a number indicating depth throughout the whole lake. And the main point right here is that Wolf Lake at this time, its maximum depth was four feet. 
All right, generally it was only around two to three feet, but its maximum depth was only around four feet. Here's some pictures uh, from a book by Shelford in 1913 of Wolf Lake. And this is what Wolf Lake looked like in 1913. It was basically a little bit of open water, mostly wetland or emergent vegetation, that is shrubs, grasses, that sort of thing. Get close to the shore, you get the shrubs, go a little bit farther from shore, you'll start to get the, the trees and things on some of the higher ground, all right? So this is what it looked like only about 100 years ago, like that. It was more wetland than lake, although we'll still call it a lake. So to diagram some of this, we have time down here, and we kind of look at the ecological succession of what's happened at Wolf Lake over the past 1,000 years. Started off basically as Lake Michigan, became a bay, then it was an inland lake once it was cut off, but fairly open inland lake. And then it was transitioning to a wetland. And this was kind of uh, where we are at the beginning of the 20th century. If this process were to continue, that wetland would eventually fill in, it would become prairie, that prairie would have a few trees, it would be savanna, and eventually it would become forest. And this particular, what I'm calling an environmental trajectory, is based on what we know has happened there, as well as a lot of the work um, out of the Indiana Dunes by Cowles, who did a lot of the work on ecological succession. So uh, there's a lot of research detailing a lot of this um, stuff right here. Furthermore, Cowles, who did the terrestrial work at the Indiana Dunes and elsewhere in, around here on ecological succession, had a colleague named Shelford, I showed a couple of his pictures, he did similar projects on the aquatic communities in this region and found, you know, kind of the similar thing right here. Furthermore, Shelford saw that there was also changes in the um, fish communities associated with these changes. And it just so turns out that at Wolf Lake we have quite a bit of data on fish. Starting with this guy named Seth Meek, he worked at the Field Museum in 1898. He picked up a seine or a net, hopped on the train in Chicago, got off here in, Indi um, in Indiana, uh, took a fish survey, preserved those fish. These fish are still in the Field Museum, all right, from 1898. Somebody else went there 10 years later or so, got some more fish, another 10 years, picked up some more fish, more fish, all the way up basically until the present day. And so I went through the collection, found all these jars, recorded all of this sort of stuff, went through all the reports, and using all of this information, created a list of all the fish that have been known from Wolf Lake from 1898 to present. And I know you can't really read this, but each one of these is a species name right here, um, and I'm going to show when they appeared. If you're a real diehard and want to know what they are, let me know. I'll send you a paper. All right? I've been, so it's been published, or you can just Google it. It's out there. So... From 1898 to 1937, these are the fish species that were found in Wolf Lake. And in that time, if you remember 1898, it was basically this shallow wetland, all right? A lot of grasses and sedges and that sort of thing out there, only about four feet deep. And those are the species. And I'll talk more about what those particular species tell us in, in a little bit. Um, Later in the 1920s, 1930s, um, actually a railroad was built through the middle of Wolf Lake. You see that homes are being built along the side, so a little bit of industry is moving in. Um, we don't have a lot of resolution of the fish data, so I kind of clumped it all together for this particular period. But those are the fishes we have there. But environmental change is happening. Big change, as Ted mentioned, this is actually in the 1950s, and that was with the construction of the interstate through the middle of Wolf Lake. To construct this, what they needed was fill, sand, as to form the basement of, of the highways. And to get that, they dredged out Wolf Lake. And in order to get the dredging equipment in, they, they created all these levees all over the place. So Wolf Lake went from four feet deep to about 17 feet deep in different parts. It was basically gouged out and was used to construct the, the highway right through the middle of it, as well as more homes and industry. Lake Calumet. Very similar. We have Interstate 94 on the west shore of uh, Lake Calumet. And it's around that same time that Lake Calumet was dredged for the Port of uh, Chicago and all that other stuff. So it was similarly very shallow dredge, very similar history as what we see here. And what we see is certain species that dropped off. We picked up some, and then some kind of blink in and out. Starting in the 70s and 80s, uh, we see a really big uptick in sport fishery. Now, people were always catching fish. They've been doing this for ever and ever and ever and ever. But it became much more managed uh, in, the, in the 70s, 60s, but 60s into the 70s. 
So now we see a large influx of popular sport fish like bass, walleye, uh, muskie, pike, uh, supplemental perch, all of these types of things. These are all top level predators and they all eat all the smaller fish and they can have a significant impact on the fish community. And we see that here. Some more dropping off, we see some additions of some species. And then from around 1980 to 2008, we see a large influx of invasive species. Um, they're not just, these are just fish ones, there's others like zebra mussels uh, that a lot of people have certainly heard about. Invasive species have been in the region since the 1800s, late 1800s. Um, so they're, they're not new with that respect. But we did see a lot more of them starting around the 1980s up into the 1990s in the Great Lakes and, and elsewhere. So we see that particular change. And so there's a couple of things that um, I want to talk about based on this particular pattern right here. First of all, the number of species has not really changed much over time. All right. You may see, yeah, it looks like there's fewer here. That actually has more to do with sampling effort and what, with how these species were sampled over time. Uh, our sampling methods for fishes have changed a lot over the past 100, 150 years. And effort kind of goes up and down. As you can imagine, there were almost no fish surveys during World War II. Go around 10 years, starting in the 50s and 60s, then we start to see them. And there's also been a lot more fish surveys uh, recently because of the Clean Water Act and stuff like that. So the number of species hasn't really changed very much. Um, but we do see that the, well, let's, I'll go to the next slide here. And we do see something about the ecology associated with these different species, and that has changed. So up here we see that these species were here originally and they disappeared. These species are all typically sensitive to environmental degradation. So once the, the habitat starts to deteriorate, these are typically species like black chin shiner, black nose shiner, and some others like that. They're typically the first ones to disappear. And it's also tend to be more wetland species. So basically what this is telling us is the fringing wetlands around Wolf Lake are disappearing and the water quality is starting to deteriorate in various aspects like that. And then these sensitive species, they disappear. Then we have some other species that were here the whole time. Who gives a good representative of that? This is a species that is very hardy, very durable. We find it in uh, pristine environments. We find it in degraded environments. Okay, they can just they can live pretty much anywhere. And so we have a suite of these species that have sort of survived the entire time like that. I didn't really indicate it right here, but then we see some of these species coming in, and these are some of the game fish coming in, and that's. Um, because, uh, so we see a drop off of some of those here, up to some of those here, and then we get things like the round goby. This is an invasive species that entered the Great Lakes and the ballast tanks of freighters from the Black Sea. Same, similar story that you probably heard with zebra mussels, quagga mussels, um, all kinds of other things like that that have caused a lot of problems. But then there's a bunch of other things that sort of moved in as well. And so this kind of demonstrates that the human actions on Wolf Lake and the Calumet region in general have had a significant impact on the fish community over time. But what's more important is that our activities have actually changed over time, over the past hundred years. And that is the intensity of whatever pressures we're exerting on the system have changed. Initially, there was a lot of habitat loss. That sort of stabilized, all right? The shoreline sort of stabilized. But the intensity of the, the human impact changed more to the sport fishery and then from invasive species. Whereas invasive species did not have a big impact up here, they do down here. Yes? I'm sorry, did this, uh, the introduction, the sport fishery, did they introduce those species or did they naturally? It's a mixture of both, but what's probably more to the point is that when they manage a fishery, they put, start putting in a lot of them. So whereas initially, so for example, like in, in Wolf Lake, all it was had bass. All right, bass were certainly always there. Uh, but when you, there's always a limited number of top level predators. But people want to catch bass and all these other things, so you start putting more and more of them in there. And that has kind of a cascading effect down the food web where they're starting to eat some of the smaller fish, some of the mills like that. So they start to drop off and then you start to see more of these things. So it's more the supplemental stocking of some of them. Some of them are, are more new. Um, for instance, tiger muskie is actually a hybrid between a couple of different species. And so some of those things are starting to be introduced. 
So some of these are certainly novel. Um, Chinook salmon is one that has entered the lake from time to time. They're not native to the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. Uh, technically invasive, but very popular. That's a po I, can, I have a whole hour-long invasive species Great Lakes talk. <laughs> Salmon are, are a popular invasive species because we still put them in there. But we also change the management style and that um, if we have a lot of these top-level predators, we start to be are worried about the food base that's out there. So we, then, if there's not enough for these predators to eat, we start putting in food for them to eat. So we're actually manipulating the top of the food web and the bottom of the food web. And so, once again, we were doing that in a subtle, in, in, in a subtle way in Wolf Lake and a lot of our inland lakes. Lake Michigan is like to the extreme where it's crazy, where we're actually managing invasive species as a food base for other invasive species that people like to catch, the salmon and everything else. I want to find out if there's a more sensitive fish species other than the three that, 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 that we've seen before, including lake sturgeon, island garter, and banded killifish. Are there more out there? There are, I would say that there are some more out there. Ask me the question again in five minutes if I don't answer it for you. I have some slides coming up <laughs> about that topic. All right. So we see a switch in the fish community that is fitting with the sort of the anthropocentric uh, impacts on the lake. So going back to this diagram, initially we were on this particular trajectory. And based on how you define anthropocene, feel free to wiggle this line backwards or forwards. Um, but the idea is that the human impact is basically reset from what was on this trajectory back down to here. We've gone from what is going to be a wetland transitioning to prairie back down to inland lake. I like that. Both physically and in terms of the uh, fish community and the ecology associated with these, with these species. So of course the next question is where do we go from here? You, and as you can imagine, there's all kinds of different stakeholders that have all kinds of different opinions about where they would like to go forwards in the future. If you're interested in sport fishing, you will have one opinion. If you're interested in birding, you will actually have a slightly different opinion as to what you would like to see the future of the lake to look like. If you're building a home or a housing development along the lake, you're going to have a slightly different opinion. If you're running a business or involved with some of the local industry, you're going to have a slightly different opinion. If you're maintaining the tollway or local roads, you're also going to have a slightly different opinion. So we have, and there's probably more and more opinions. And so, as you can imagine, the future of the lake and the region is still very uncertain as to which direction we're actually going to go from this particular point. But we have had a huge impact today. Now, given that, Fortunately, and this is somewhat accidental, we still have all of these options available to us. Because as you mentioned, there are still some sensitive species in the area. Uh, for example, you mentioned the banded killifish, Iowa darter, these both like clean water, they're sensitive to environmental degradation, and they're both in Wolf Lake and the Calumet region in general. Uh, there's some other ones, uh, Lake Chub Suckers here, if you want a diff slightly different one. Lake Sturgeon is a is a different story, um, as I would say. A lot of people like to talk about Lake Sturgeon. Lake Sturgeon, if you don't know, that's the largest fish in the Great Lakes. They get as big as myself or bigger. Um, uh, there's been talk about them being in Wolf Lake and Lake Calumet, Calumet River. Y yeah, sort of. I don't want to go on too big of a tangent. It was more of a Lake Michigan population that there than a hundred years ago, individuals would go into the, the Calumet River and the Calumet wetlands to feed, probably didn't live there the whole lives, but probably did spawn on Indiana Shoals and other places like that. Largely disappeared because of overfishing, slowly making a comeback. Problem is for Lake Sturgeon, their generation time is around 20 to 30 years, or at least 15 to 25 years. So you can imagine this comeback is going to take a very, very long time. But anyways, we still have some uh, sensitive species in Wolf Lake, in other words, you saw this in the film, the mud puppy. This is a fully aquatic salamander. Um, most of, when people think about salamanders, you roll over logs, you find them living underneath logs and stuff. These actually live completely underwater uh, their entire lives, breathing through these gills. Very sensitive to pollution, very sensitive to habitat degradation. Uh, we've had a research project ongoing at Wolf Lake on these for several years now. And we have uh, caught 
several hundred of these and mark them out in the lake. So, and that's just a tiny part of the lake. And as I think we said in that film earlier, this is one of the largest populations of mud puppies in the state for some reasons in Wolf Lake. I don't know, complete accident. Uh, not by intention, but they're there. So we have a lot of these sensitive species living here in Wolf Lake, literally right next to the interstate, which is right here, with all this industry. All right. And that's one of the things that is most perplexing about the Calumet region. <coughs> and Wolf Lake and, and, and places like this. But it also makes it super intriguing and has also made it one of these really, one, has really drawn our attention about asking and answering these questions about the Anthropocene. Now going back to this um, diagram, there's a few things I'd like to, to mention right here. First of all, depending upon which direction you want to go, or actually I should step back and say, Given the particular geomorphology, topography, geology, soils, hydrology, climate, all of that sort of stuff, if nature was left to its own devices, it would tend to follow this path. All right, this is sort of the direction this region sort of goes on, this lake plain right here. Uh, we, of course, have the resources, if we wanted to, to move it in whatever direction we would wish to do. But the further you get away from this particular trajectory, the more resources would be required to achieve that point and maintain it. And by resources, I mean funding, money, uh, effort in terms of uh, you know work hours or what have you. I mean, so we could turn you know the Calumet into a giant bay by dredging it out, but that would cost trillions of dollars. No one's saying they're going to do that. But I'm just saying, if you wanted to go that route, yes. That is a possibility. It would be super, super expensive. But the easiest, the most cost effective, and easiest to maintain is something close, closer to that particular trajectory because of the conditions here. And then a couple other aspects I want to say about this is that traditional views of restoration are not valid in urban settings. And what I mean by this, and, and there's a couple things. One, there's a practical point of view. And I think a lot of people sort of know this and sense this in that we have around 10 to 12 million people living in the Chicago region, all right? We are not going to restore anything in the Chicago region to pristine state, okay? Not going to happen, okay? And I'm going to assume no one's going to argue that particular point. Um, so when you see a lot of restoration projects here, like at Big Marsh, it's largely the best we can do within these particular types of circumstances or something like that. And this is sort of, so whenever we say restoration projects, it's sort of pseudo restoration projects, all right? Because we're not truly restoring these things to what the conditions are like 200 to 500 years ago within this particular region or whatever. Now, another aspect that I want us to, to point out here is that perhaps we don't really want to restore to those historical conditions. Earlier, I kept talking about these trajectories, about how all of these ecosystems are changing all the time from one thing to another to another. And that instead of, and a lot of people that when they do restoration projects tend to have a very static view of nature, thinking nature is a particular thing and it tends to stay in that condition uh, for the long term. We know that's not the case. We know that nature is always changing. So perhaps when we talk about restoration, we should focus more upon what a particular area or ecosystem could become with an eye towards the future. And that really should be our aim. Not restoring it to what it was like a couple hundred to several hundred years ago, but restoring it to a condition that it can move along whatever path we uh, so choose for it. And so, and so another aspect of that is that when a lot of people are doing restoration projects, particularly in urban settings, we often talk about this balance between people and nature. All right, and this is where people start to think about um, sustainability, recycling, green architecture, green landscaping, what have all of the, all of these types of things. So they can go on and on and on. But I think that there is actually we're subtly missing the point here. And that some people uh, sort of pick up on this, but we rarely truly, I think, understand or act on that. Because whenever we talk about human society and nature, you're subconsciously setting up an us versus them situation. All right? Where we have like people on one hand, nature on the other hand, and this sort of 
creates a conflict or that we need to find this balance or something like that. When in reality, human society and nature are actually one environment. All right? Different aspects of that, but this is one. All right? It's not really separate. It, it not, not in urban settings, not even in the wilderness. It's, not, it's completely interwoven. All right? So we need to think more along those particular lines, and we also have to realize not only is human society always changing, nature is always changing as well. And these, both of these things are changing at the time and intermingled. So trying to figure out what to do in the future then becomes that much more complicated. Now, one good example of what I'm trying to talk about here and demonstrate here would be climate change. I'm actually going to say next thing, nothing about climate change because we could do a day long, well, we could do a month long section just on climate change. You've heard a little bit about it right here. But this just sort of exemplifies how interconnected and interwoven people and nature really are on a global scale. All right. Getting back down more to more local examples, um, I would argue the Lake Michigan shoreline is one that could really benefit from a lot of the principles that I've been talking here today. You've probably heard a lot in the news about high water levels in Lake Michigan. If you are here 10 years ago, you probably heard a lot about low water levels in Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan's very dynamic, goes up and down. Um, infrastructure is crumbling in Illinois and Indiana, and there's a lot of erosion, or boats are getting in and out back and forth. Um, and basically, we're, we don't see a lot of very effective long-term planning um, with a lot of these particular projects right here. So many of the things where I've talked about today about the integration of people and nature and changing in these trajectories could really fit very well with this particular system. Uh, another one that we are seeing some advances in is the Chicago River. So this is actually Goose Island right here. And then uh, this is a part of the Chicago River over here. This is a project that we have up there where we are installing these uh, floating gardens. All right. At this point, there's not a lot growing on there. It's a little earlier in the year, but later in the year, these are covered with plants, sometimes vegetables, flowers, all that sort of thing. And to see these um, at, for the past several years, um, you would either have to walk along the sidewalk and look down on them, or take a kayak and then come over and visit them. But earlier this year, uh, we've actually installed a floating sidewalk, so now, and it's handicap accessible and everything. So now, anybody can go back, go in there, and walk along these types of things. And next week, actually, Mayor Lightfoot is going to have a ribbon cutting ceremony for this particular project. So, so it's, getting, it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. And what it's really doing is it's breaking down this barrier between the Chicago River and the people that live in Chicago. All right? What everybody knows the Chicago River is there, but it was always distant. People didn't really think about it, even if you're going over and walking next to it. And that was the greatest threat to the river is people not caring about it or, or, or drawing that connection with it. Now we're breaking down these barriers so that people can get closer to this and then begin to appreciate that and experience that. And there are other examples of this, such as downtown Chicago with the Riverwalk, which is a similar type of thing where we're trying to draw these connections. Now, if you were to step back and look at sort of how the Chicago River operates on a fundamental level with the particular processes involved with it and compare it to other rivers in the world like this is the Kyder Falls in Guyana where almost nobody lives um, there's really no difference between these rivers it's the context around it but fundamentally this river is no different than the Chicago River the Chicago River flows yes through canyons of skyscrapers this one flows through rainforest over waterfalls in South America but fundamentally, these ecosystems are the same. Whether you're talking about an urban setting or wilderness setting, they are on different ends of a continuum, if you will, but they're more similar than different. And the same thing goes for people. This is a, these are students in Bolivia where I taught a course on aquatic uh, conservation. And once again, people all over the planet, once you get down to it, are basically the same as well. And so that's why uh, we like to argue that lessons learned in Wolf Lake or Big Marsh Lake, Kelly Met, put whatever word you want up there, can help save the planet because this, what's happening here, is happening globally as well. And this is some of the reasons that we have started this documentary project, uh, Wolf Lake Abides, to sort of address these issues in the modern day in the Anthropocene. And with that, if there's any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them.
Sharon. Yeah. Where do you ask? Good to see you. How are you? How, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> um, how do you act? Where do you access those floating gardens? I heard about those about four years ago at a talk. Yeah. I I, then I haven't heard much about how they're progressing. Either. Yeah. So it's That's just really it's just uh, south of North Avenue. Um, behind, there's an REI. The actual access point is at oh, REI is off REI? of. Okay. I can't remember the name of the road now, but just just south of North Avenue, where basically where North Avenue crosses the Chicago River. I there's that turning it was basin. Somewhere around there, but I've never actually. Yeah, I think I've seen. Kingsbury, it maybe. But it's a diagonal road. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? Well, it's right. It's Kingsbury, right, right Kingsbury. where the Whole Foods is, and it, there's there, an art store there. The pilot project store. was right behind Whole Foods. Yeah. And it has now expanded to REI, so, okay. to right behind REI, so those are the places. Right, right. isn't there a plan to make it quite long, this whole? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's expanding all the time. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what kind of conditions does Wolf Lake have that allow the mud puppy to, to persist, even though it's so sensitive? And what, what kind of like, trends are the populations following? Right. Oh, so two questions. You asked about the trends in the population. We don't have a good grasp on that because until a few years ago, nobody really looked at it. So we know in the short term, they seem, I'm going to say stable, so that's based on limited data. Um, it's, a, it's interesting. I don't want to talk, I, I, we have a lot of presentations, but, you can imagine them all <laughs> but, but basically, we've known for a long time that there were mud puppies in Wolf Lake. Um, but they're a very strange creature because they're most active in the middle of winter, not in the summer. And they're a salamander, so they're, they're an amphibian. But nobody sees them in the summer. They, they go into hiding. And so when most people are out there, you can't see them. But they come out actually under the ice. We start catching them when the water temperatures drop in the fall, and we, they start disappearing in the spring uh, when water temperatures go back up. And we kind of know what that threshold is now through, through our research. And so people never really knew they were out there because they're, they're and they tend to be nocturnal. So these come out at night in January. And so people rarely would see these types of things. The people that would see them were ice fishermen. And so they would catch a lot of these mud puppies. And we have this Save the Mud Puppy campaign. And it's because a lot of people that were fishing would catch these things. They were weird. And they thought that maybe they were a threat to the fish that they were trying to catch and leave them on the ice to kill them which is not the case, because they, they are in no way competing with game fish at all. And so we started this campaign to kind of do that. So we've always kind of known they were there, but it was always accidental until we went out and looked for them. And there were even more than we realized were out there. Mm -hmm. what we, and I, the way we know that there's a lot of them, well, we, we release all the ones that we catch, but we put pit tags in them. So the same thing that you put into dogs or cats to trace them, we put those into these mud puppies so that we can see the tags. And we've tagged several hundred unique individuals within, if you know where the flagpole is, at Wolf Lake, only within that particular area. We haven't been surveyed the whole place. There's, there's a lot of them. How long have we lived? Several years at least. We, we, we tagged one and caught it like four or five years later, actually. So we know they live at least that long. I don't know what the maximum age is. I, I want to ask if there are other fish species inhabiting Wolf Lake, including Lake, <clears throat> lake Perch, Lake Whitefish, Bourbon, Bowfin, what else? And other fish that, that come from either Lake Michigan or the other, or, or, or the other couple. So you're asking about these fish that come from Lake Michigan into Wolf Lake? Yeah, as, 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 as well as Lake Calumet and a, and a few other lakes in the Calumet area. Yes. Does that answer? Uh, so yes, fish do move back and forth all the time. Uh, they do move into the lake. It depends on the particular ones. Bourbon, probably not, because they like colder water, deeper water. Lake whitefish would be a bit of a stretch as well. Perch, yes, and they can certainly do so. Now the catch is, uh, the current outlet from Wolf Lake is Indian Creek, and it is partially blocked at times, so that fish may or may not always be able to swim through that blockage. When that blockage was not there, fish could move far more easily. As a matter of fact, what was it, like 10, 20 years ago, it was like elbow and elbow people fishing for salmon along that creek because there were so many salmon swimming from Lake Michigan up into Wolf Lake. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they could in turn go back and forth. And we know that it may even be possible that mud puppies might be moving back and forth. 
but because of particular issues, and I'm not going to really go into on certain properties, that may or may not be possible right now. So as long as Indian Creek is open. Lake Calumet, yes, they can. Now, there are lock and dam structures here and there in the Calumet River, but fish can get moved through those. And I know in the Calumet River, I've seen fish swimming up and down, mostly big fish like rainbow trout and salmon, and so those certainly can move back and forth. And we know that this has been the case since the late 1800s because someone named Nelson wrote about fish from Lake Michigan swimming into the Calumet River in like a paper in 1876 or something mm -hmm. like that. And so much so, and I'll, I'll add a few more details here. Calumet region is super flat, okay? We talk about these uh, region swales and dunes swales. I mean, a dune is what, this high? I mean, this is like the elevation difference in the region and parts of it. I mean, it's literally that much. Um, when there was a strong wind coming from the north, it would actually pile up Lake Michigan water, and that water would go churning up to the Calumet River. Calumet River typically could be a little muddy. Lake Michigan's a bit clear. You can see this clear water actually moving up the Calumet River, and with that, Lake Michigan fish would swim miles up the Calumet River. When the wind subsided, all that water would then come back out, and then the muddy Calumet water would start flowing back out, and the Calumet River fish would retake those territories, and the Lake Michigan fish would move back out of the way. And this, well, is, this, we, this is the case many, many years ago. That has been severely messed up because of the Lock and Dam structure, O'Brien Lock and Dam, and a number of other factors, but it has happened. Was, 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 was there a spawning Lake Sturgeon population years or centuries ago before, this, before, before all this industrialization happened and stuff? In Wolf Lake or the region or Re -re region in places like Indian Creek. So uh, there are right if you go through and, and you'll see a lot of mentions that people did say that sturgeon spawned in, in Wolf Lake and, and places like that. I don't believe it. Uh, it's not sturgeon spawning territory. Sturgeon spawn over cobbles and big rocks, fast flowing water, very clean water. They don't spawn in wetlands. If they were to lay their eggs in wetlands, they would get covered up with silt and be smothered and die. So I do not believe that sturgeon ever spawned in Wolf Lake, Lake Calumet. Maybe they swam far enough, the, the little cow, grand cow, or something like that, to the moraines where you may have some situations like that. Most of the sturgeon spawning, I think, in the region probably occurred out on Lake Michigan on the Indiana Shoals, which fit this. Now it's not, it's the current from the lake that's creating all the movement. So they may have been there, or they may have spawned elsewhere, like St. Joseph River, Kalamazoo River, or places up in Wisconsin and then came down here. Sturgeon numbers in the Chicago region in the late 1800s, early 1900s were massive. Uh, there was a huge commercial fishery for it, both in the Kelly Bed and downtown Chicago. They used to catch them like right off of Lincoln Park. Uh, There's hot spots for catching lake sturgeon. They, and for many years, they were considered a nuisance. Uh, uh, the commercial fishermen would catch them and toss them to the side just to kill them. They might dry them and then would use them as firewood. And it wasn't until later yeah. that people realized that there was some type of uh, that you could eat them and get the oil out of them and all these other types of things. Ivy blacks and some other uses. But they were trash fish for many, many years and considered a nuisance. Uh, but because of this long generation time where they take 20, 25 years to reproduce, they were rapidly overfished and have largely disappeared. They are slowly now making a comeback, but it is a very, very slow. So I think, what I think they probably did, I think they did come into Lake Kelly Mad Wolf Lake, but I think they came into feed. They bought, and then that's about it, and then they went back out into the lake. And, and how we, and how we come that invasive, invasive, invasive fish species such as Asian carp, round goby, and others? Yeah, and that's, a, nobody has great answers for any of that on how to combat them. The, the, the basic strategy right now is to try the best to prevent them from becoming established in the first place because once invasive species become established, they're very, very difficult to eradicate. So that's sort of the plan, especially with Asian carp right now and, and things like that. But for those that are already established in the place, like round goby, it's hard, it's hard to say. Uh, eradicating them is going to be like next to impossible, probably. That said, and I think, um, um, John sort of mentioned pros and cons to environmental change. There are pros and cons to invasive species. 
Rob Booby that I had the picture up there is competing with a lot of our smaller fish that live along the bottom, things called darters and gobies like that, and have basically wiped those out in some instances. That's, that's I would put that as a comment. As a pro, bass love to eat them. So do lake trout. And in some places, some uh, snakes and things like that. In Lake Erie, there's an endangered species of water snake that 90% of his diet is this invasive round goby. So we have a lot of native fish that are gorging themselves on round gobies and are actually making a comeback because of this particular invasive species. So the invasive species topic is very messy, very complicated, not how you particularly, or how you usually see it portrayed in the media. Okay. And you had a question about what did we do in Wolf Lake so that their mud puppies are there, something, right? What are the conditions? What are the conditions? Um, slide. Oh, wow. they like the slag. So, okay, so yes, you probably picked up that in general in this region we have a lot of slag. People have been dumping slag all over the place, caused all kinds of problems and that sort of thing. And slag was dumped along the shorelines of Wolf Lake and other types of fill. Mud puppies like to live in very thin crevices. And one of the, the good places or, to see this is along the Kankakee River, Hickory Creek, and places like that where rivers have cut down through the limestone and have eroded the little sections of the limestone and they like to hide in those cracks. That, that's what they, that kind of made is what they like. And in Lake Michigan, they would live on the shoals among the cobbles, which are glacial deposits. They like that sort of stuff. Wetlands are typically not what they really like to do, but by putting all of the slag and boulders and things under there, we have created these little hiding places mm -hmm. for them to live all over the places. And that has actually, ironically, benefited the mud, this very sensitive species. So in this place, in this instance, industry actually helped probably bring back some of these things. Have you seen them in George Lake? Or have you never made any sample for them? I've never really looked for them in George Lake, so I, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, in your graphic on the uh, natural ecological succession, you go from uh, Lake Michigan to Inland Bay, or to Bay to Inland Lake. Yeah. What was the, in, and of course that was accelerated by the railroads on the north end of Wolf Lake, uh, by Lake Michigan. Do you know, or can you talk a bit about the <coughs> impact of closing that uh, uh, channel to Lake Michigan, and uh, have you heard much talk about possibly reopening? And what so, would that do? Oh, all right. So you're talking about what was known. It's Wolf to, River. Yeah. Because uh, it was Wolf Bay. I've seen things with it, Wolf Bay. And of course, now it's an inland lake. And it was, my understanding is around World War I is when it was closed off. Yeah. Uh, Did you need this diagram or you want to? Ma I could, maybe I should bring up them. This is going to take you a minute here to find them. I think I saw a 1929 couple map that the uh, channel is still there. To yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah, I'll show you the. I'm trying to get a. So was it filled in with Lieber Brothers? <laughs> uh, it was filled in a variety of ways. I'm trying to find a map so that everybody knows what we're all talking. It's taking me a while. I'm trying to get there. Okay, here's Wolf Lake. So there's a channel, channel up here, and I don't know how well you can see it, but this channel kind of abruptly ends at this point. This used to connect to Lake Michigan was known as Wolf River. All right. I don't know exactly when it was filled in. I suspect it was probably a gradual process. Maybe, do you know when it was I, cut off? I'm thinking around 1920s. But. All right, maybe. And that I don't really know. And I don't know how much of it was a partial cutoff. For example, there's a lot of railroad lines over here, but they probably had a bridge for a while. So you know what I mean? I don't know, but it's closed off now. It's um, really close though. Yeah, it gets oh, yeah. yeah, and so what that that used to be a more direct connection for fishes and other things to move back and forth in the lake. And we used to see more lake-oriented fish in the lake years and years ago, possibly due to this connection. Although fish can now move through here as well. It's a, it's longer, but not hideously long, and back and forth. <clears throat> there has been talk from time to time about reconnecting this. Widening this, turning this basically into an estuary, that type of situation. Um, that's you know when I when I had all those future arrows about which direction to go. You have a new opinion. Well, I'll put a new arrow on there for that. Yeah. One. I mean that's just another one of the pressures and opinions about where to go. 
But what I mean, you'd have to go through this particular land. Does the railroad go? That is a casino. Casino, yeah. yeah. There's one of the casinos on the other end. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of regions that it may not be done. I don't know if there's a lot of ecological benefits to necessarily doing that as well. Another thing, um, I don't have the numbers, but the, kind of the most polluted part of Wolf Lake is this channel up here, as you can imagine, because they're, they're, they're dumping all the stuff in there. And they have for years, not quite so much anymore. And so when the Army Corps did their restoration projects down here to put the islands in, one of their strategies was to put a bunch of islands here to basically quarantine this section of the lake and then focus on the rest of the lake. That was sort of the reason that they did a bunch of work up there. So reconnecting this is going to have to deal with a lot of sediment remediation and all kinds of other issues in that area. Which of course is going to balloon the cost and everything. Excuse me, have you seen any, um, any um, results of study of the imposition of those new wetlands up there? I am not, no. I mean, they, I know the Army Corps is mandated to do five years post-work uh, surveys. That's probably out there. I don't know if I saw anything in that that, to me, like, was super, super dramatic or beyond expectations. But if you do, if you do enough work, it, uh, those data have to be publicly available because it's a federal agency. So, yeah. You had a question. Yeah, you said uh, Wolf Lake flows into the Indian Creek Canal. What's the water source? That goes out through there. It's a lot of groundwater. Yeah. I worked at Lieber Brothers uh, for 20 years, and uh, they take water from Lake Michigan, use it in their system, treat it, and put it into the lake. Mm -hmm. and, that's yeah. Yeah. and that's part of it. They're the ones that are in the way, and before Lieber Brothers, I understand there was an amusement park there. Yeah, there's a park. Yeah, there's a park. There's Lieber Brothers was there since 1929. Yeah, so that's part of the outflow, too. Um, there are reports on the hydrology of the lake and the inputs and outputs. They're kind of old. I don't know if they're updated, but they certainly, the regulatory agencies look very closely at how much water is coming in. Is that groundwater coming A lot of it is groundwater because, once again, this is all sand. Yeah. It's beach. Yeah, yeah. It's sand beach. The water can go through here. Another that's thing I wanted to add about the uh, dog, uh, mud puppies. When we were kids, we walked along the shoreline with lights. It's summer and you see the mud puppies right along. There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that swamp they filled in between, uh, between the mills and Hegwish, there were a lot of mud puppies in there. Oh, really? Okay. So we, yeah. We picked up different things in the vent. We couldn't grab them because they were so slimy. They just, no, they are. It's a trick. Yeah, they were, yeah. the grad students had a steep yeah. learning curve trying to figure out how to pick them up to yeah. study them. <laughs> I was just curious when you're talking about like that natural progression, like mm -hmm. how roughly time-wise, like how long would it just left alone would it take for like to become? And yeah. What was the next thing? Prairie? I mean, ten thousand years, a thousand years. No. I, mean, uh, I mean, this. Yeah. So like, for Wolf Lake from here to here, that's a thousand years. For thousand. Okay. That was yeah. A, well, yeah. <laughs> roughly a thousand years. So, so maybe we're maybe talking. Maybe we are certainly years. talking long term yeah. here. Yeah. For the entire lake, but bits and pieces of it would be very different. For example, parts of the of the wetlands could turn to a prairie in a matter of years to decades. Something like that. It's turning to a forest, that's going to take a lot longer. Like 500 years. Yeah. So no, this is not something we're not talking about. Yeah. Type of and one other quick question. I, I don't know where to find out about that, but you would probably know better than anyone else. As somebody who swims in Lake Michigan a whole lot, like. How clean is it these days? I mean, I always think, oh, it's cleaner than when I was a kid, but I don't know. Can Lake speak? Michigan? Yeah. Wolf Lake? Uh, okay. no, well, Lake Michigan. Okay, okay Lake yes. Michigan? I've only swam in Wolf Lake once. <laughs> so the water quality in Wolf Lake is actually pretty good. Yeah, I think you said that the day we were down there. Yeah, don't dig. Yeah, don't, don't start digging holes at the bottom of it. But the water's pretty good. The water's okay. Um, uh, Lake Michigan is yeah. pretty, I mean, it's our drinking water. Right. And they I don't mean, treat it that much. Yes. And I'm not knocking yeah. on the people treating it. They don't have to treat it that much because it's pretty clean. Right. No, it's in, it's in pretty so good shape. So swimming, I mean, it's quite clean. It's not anything that you have to worry about. So, and I'm going to give you, no, no, in general, no. Lake yeah. Michigan should be just fine. But I'm, gonna, I'm glad. That was my understanding. But like I recently just talked to others, like, oh, I don't swim in there. It's, you know, they, there's that refinery in Whitey. And I said, yeah, I know. He's well, like, common they sense. They release stuff into the lake. Yeah. Uh, I'd swim way up north. At first I thought he meant north of Chicago. He meant like 
Minnesota or something. Oh, yeah. you know, where I was uh, so I'm going to give you a couple. Well, okay. So a couple of answers. One of those common sense. No, don't swim in the whiting outflows. Right. Obviously. Of course. All right. Okay. Don't do that. Right. Uh, swimming at North no, Avenue Beach. That's now another another issue is E. coli and stuff right. like that. So do pay attention to beach closures right. in particular bays. And there's a whole program about that. Go online, they monitor all of that sort of stuff very, very closely and have actually some incredible models modeling a lot of that. And a lot of people are under the perception that those E. coli outbreaks are, um, are human. It's like human pollution. And, and, and part of it sort of is, but it's also natural. And it has to do with the temperature and turbulence of the sediments underneath and other various conditions like that can actually cause these outbreaks as well. And if some of these outbreaks get, can get, um, sometimes they get even worse and you can have botulism mixed in there as well, so pay attention to that. But once again, city of Chicago and local municipalities are generally all over that. They're very conservative about that. USGS, the US Geological Survey, has developed models that the city uses and they test on and on and on. So, so that part, so keep an eye out for those E. coli yeah, outbreaks. Yeah, here sometimes, regions. beach closures yeah. because of whatever. Right, so you gotta keep an eye on that. Don't swim right. in refinery outflows. And right. But Lake Michigan itself is pretty clear, and it looks clearer now, of course, than, I mean, did you swim in the lake 50 years ago, 40 years ago? I mean, I, yeah, I, did. I did. Yeah, yeah. And it was a lot murkier. Right. Okay, that's because of invasive species. So that is the quagga mussels and zebra mussels, an invasive species that came in the same way as the round gobies in the ballast uh, tanks and freighters. Came in, they're only about as big as your thumb, but there's quite drillions of, I don't know how many are out there. They, they absolutely cover the bottom of, of the lake in certain places. They're filter feeders, so they filter out uh, plankton, which is uh, microscopic plants and animals, out of the lake. And there are so many of them, and they've been at it since the 1980s, that the lake actually looks clear. So at one time when you dove into Lake Michigan in like the 1980s, you're, you could probably only see around 5, 10 feet. Go to that same spot now, you can see 50 to 100. It does seem clear. Yeah. But, then it's, but then it's weird up in Wisconsin, Door County, the beach is there, I've noticed, which I've been swimming in for 58 years or more too, more, they, um, there's like this green glop at the shore. I don't think it extends real far. And I think I've heard that's because of the zebra mussels too, eating too much, eating so much plankton that more sunlight is coming through the water and making the, I guess it's algae or. Yes. Gross. So the water so, used to so be. So that's kind of gross. Now you go in and there's like this pea soup for, you know, right. four or five feet. So everybody always tries to blame things on invasive species. In some cases, rightly so. In other cases, it's kind of more overreaction. But in, in that case, it's, it's partially what's happening is that the water used to be so murky that the light couldn't penetrate very far. So there was not much algal growth in Lake Michigan along the bottom. But now that the water's clear, light can get down there and we get more algae and some other plants. And that's creating some of the goop that you're okay. talking about. That but that goop, is, that goop has always been there. So depending um, upon the current, you could get that regardless of the zebra mussels. Okay. But the zebra mussels and quagga mussels are exacerbating that particular situation. I say zebra mussels because that's what everybody's familiar with. Zebra mussels are almost completely eliminated from Lake Michigan. They've been replaced by their close cousins, quagga mussels, which are superior competitors to the zebra mussels. But in Wolf Lake has zebra mussels, and I've yet to see a quagga mussel in huh. Wolf Lake, which is a little strange. But anyway, sorry, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Usually in the spring, and those are probably mostly alewives. It can happen with other species. Alewives. Yeah, it can it can happen with other species, but it's typically with alewives because they tend to be more sensitive to temperature changes. And so in the spring, when the water gets That's warm, totally it gets thing to happen. sort of. Okay, <laughs> you're asking a fish biologist for a simple answer to a fish question. Uh, <laughs> alewives are invasive. They they came in through the um, the Welland Canal, accidentally. And their numbers completely exploded in the 50s and especially into the 60s. Um, I don't know if, if people remember that I far do. back. Yeah, these, this is when yes, yeah, bulldozers would have to go up there, bucket loaders, and they would lift them up there. And, and, 
Yeah, probably. Now, and it, and it happened after that, uh, but at a reduced extent. But you can still see a lot of them, and you can still see a lot of them. You're right. Further north, you do tend to see more alewives up there. Uh, you don't see it as often now because alewife numbers have drastically plummeted for a couple of reasons. Um, one, salmon were introduced into the lake. The, the official story for why salmon were introduced into the Great Lakes was to control alewives and get that nuisance species under control. The actual story is various states have been trying to stalk salmon into the Great Lakes for about 100 years and failed and failed and failed because there wasn't enough food. So they tried to stalk something else, namely smelt, as food, but that didn't take off quite enough for food. And then the alewives came along, and then they're like, oh, finally we can stalk salmon in here because there's enough for them to eat. So what we basically have is this invasive species. A popular invasive species is, was intentionally stalked to eat an unpopular invasive species. Okay. That, that's a very short version of the story. Now, back end. Alewives eat a variety of different things. The smaller, <coughs> excuse me, the smaller eat plankton. All right? These microscopic plants and animals. The same thing zebra and quagga mussels eat. So now, alewives are getting this double whammy. They're being devoured by these salmon uh, from the top, and they're running out of food from down below because of competition from another invasive species. So we have this sort of weird Thunderdome type situation with all these invasive species battling each other. And the alewives lost out and their numbers started plummeting. And in Lake Huron, they almost completely disappeared. And so did the salmon fishery because there was no longer salmon, or there was no longer food for the salmon to eat. That's, those early warning signs started to appear in Lake Michigan. Alewives numbers started to plummet and fishery managers in Lake Michigan began to panic. And what was once this horrible, you know, kind of the poster child for invasive species that we wanted to get rid of, we're now managing alewives to bring their numbers back up so there's more food for salmon to eat. Uh, so they're still out there, they're at a lower level. They're, they would actually, ironically, they don't, they don't want to come out and say this too, too much, but they would actually like to see more alewives out there so that there's more food for the salmon to eat because people like to catch the salmon. And, but, so their numbers are going up. The die-off is not a concern. That I no, those numbers, those numbers are not nearly, are not impacting the population out there at all. No. Yeah. What's, what's the lamprey number like now? Lamprey, um, so yeah. step back, see lamprey are these sort of eel-like creatures that have a, a mouth as a suction cup. Yeah with teeth in it, and they latch onto the side of a fish and chew a hole in the side of the fish, and they suck out the blood and fluids and, and stuff like that. Also an invasive species, also came in through the Welland Canal, uh, up through the St. Lawrence and then the Welland Canal, and through the, the Great Lakes, and did a huge amount of harm to a lot of the fisheries, and especially lake trout, because they came in, I can't remember when sea lamprey first entered, it was in the 40s or 50s, it was before a lot of the other things before the salmon were really there. So the salmon, or the lake trout, really took a hit. A lot of people like to blame sea lamprey for the dramatic declines in lake trout. The reality is we were overfishing the lake trout for decades, their numbers were going way down. And then the lamprey came in, and that was kind of like the last nail in the coffin. coffin. Such though that lake trout were actually extirpated from Lake Michigan. We had no more native Lake Michigan lake trout. But we did have them in other parts of the Great Lake, and we have since restocked them and they're coming back up. Sea lamprey, they're still out there. Their numbers are moderate, tends to go up and down. But we're paying 17 to 20 million dollars a year to keep those numbers down. And there's growing reaction about whether, about those methods, because the way to keep them down is to poison the rivers where they spawn it. Right. And the official story is this poison only affects the lampreys. It doesn't. It affects a lot of other fish in those rivers too, but that's, yeah. and they know that. The other aspect is, another control strategy is to have dams at the mouth of rivers so that they can catch the lamprey at those dams and prevent them from going upstream. Problem now is people love lake sturgeon that we talked about. Lake sturgeon spawn in the same places that lamprey like to do but cannot get to them because of these dams. So ironically, this invasive species control measure that is trying to control the sea lamprey is also harming the lake sturgeon. And so we're running into some serious conflicts along those lines of Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I had a friend who was uh, used to laugh and told me that 
the Indiana had declared the Grand Calumet River dead in like 1980. What is the, the status of the Grand Calumet River? Do you study that? I'm sorry, it's, just, it's still tied to the region. Yeah, no, it is. Um, I don't do a lot of stuff in the, in the Grand Cal or, or a little Cal. Um, they're doing better. It's slow um, because of all the sediment contamination. That's that's the biggest biggest difficulty and cost whenever there are projects associated like that. I would say the numbers are going up. It's slowly recovering, but it's a slow, slow recovery. I would not say it's dead. I would not say it's doing great. But, but you know, it's... It, 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 it's getting better. It'd be nice to see it getting better faster, but if unless you have a few billion dollar line around to clean up the sediment, it's kind of hard to figure out what to do. And then and then restore those wetlands along there. That's really what that's really what that needs is a lot more of those fringing wetlands that it has some, but it would be great to see. <coughs> excuse me, a lot more of those. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. One more question. A while ago, I remember reading an article about some sponges being found at Wolf Lake. Can you elaborate on where they fit in? Uh, well, um, I did not know sponges were found there, were they? No, you don't I know don't about that. Okay, they could be. Yeah, I'm not debating that. Um, there are actually native sponges in the region. I have seen them in Lake Michigan, so not too far from here. So I know they're out there. They have been found in the Chicago River and, and other areas like that. They used to be more common in the past, but once again, they 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 are very sensitive to a couple of things. Pollution will do that, but so will sedimentation. So if the water is really silty and covers them up, they, they will tend to get smothered. So they need to, the water moving past because once again, they're filter feeders. So they take the water in through parts of their pores, spit it out another side, and they have to keep doing that. And if there's a lot of fine sediments, that clogs basically their mouth, their intakes, and they, they kind of get smothered out there. But they were always very sort of low key, at least in recent history. I would say 100 years ago, if you and I were to go out and look for a sponge, we could find one. These days, it's a lot harder, but they are still out there. They are probably more common than people realize because they're very inconspicuous. And when people think about sponges, you're probably thinking about what people find in the Mediterranean or off of Florida where they're like big clumps or maybe this big or something. The ones around here are like crusting. They're like this a thin crust over rocks. So they're very subtle and hidden and you kind of have to know what you're looking for to find them. So yeah, they're out there. They're more common than people realize. But not, not super common. 